Good morning. My name is Pumla Williams. As we prepare to move to level, lev, level three, we are hosting the Minister of Arts and Culture, Minister Natim Tetwa. He is accompanied by the Director General of the Department, uh, the DG Mkize. For this media briefing, I am assisted from the lines by Ishmael from the WhatsApp. I'm assisted by Nungeba. For the sign language, I'm assisted by Keta and Andiswa. And at this point, I would invite the minister to address the media briefing. Thank you. Thank you very much, DG, DG uh, Williams uh, from GCIS, and uh, congratulations for your appointment as the new Director General. Uh, the DG of uh, Sport, Arts and Culture, members of the media, uh, dear compatriots. <coughs> we meet today as we close off Africa Month, a very significant month for the continent. And uh, on the back of Africa Day, which was on the 25th of, of, of May uh, 2020, Africa Day is not only about celebrating our proud heritage uh, and our culture as, as Africans, but it is also a time to reflect on progress made uh, uh, in unifying our continent and uh, on the whole program of uh, integration, uh, integration of the continent. This week, we also honor the legacy of the Lady Smith Black Mambazo, who celebrated the 60th uh, birthday on the 28th of May, 2020. The group led by the late uh, Joseph Shabalala, along with many other cultural and heritage assemblies, ensembles, should be celebrated for the role they played as ambassadors of South Africa in spreading peace and unity on the continent and globally. Today, not only are we faced with the challenge of unifying Africa, we are also faced with the challenge of beating COVID-19. There is no more time prudent than now to show solidarity to one another as Africans. As a department, we'll continue to do all we could and all in our power to alleviate the impact of coronavirus on practitioners of sport uh, and arts and culture. We were propelled by this state of affairs when we committed ourselves uh, to do something to try and soften the impact uh, of coronavirus. On the 25th of March, we announced a 150 million relief fund to assist artists, athletes, technical personnel, and the core ecosystem of the sector nationally. The other part of this fund was open to proposals for live streaming, the work of uh, creatives, and athletes, particularly intergenerational cooperation between the younger uh, creatives and athletes and the legends. This work has started in earnest. <coughs> the embassies of sport, arts and culture in all the nine provinces have since announced the provincial relief funds uh, to assist athletes and artists at that level. These funds amount to more than 50 million rands combined. We thank them for their commitment 
in serving the sector. If you add this amount to the one announced nationally, it is more than 200 million rands at the disposal of the sector to date. We have agreed with the MECs in our consultative meetings, uh, in the consultative meetings we had, that if a person receives funds from one level, he or she may not be assisted again at another level. For an example, you get financial assistance from the National Relief Fund. The province where you come from is then exempted from providing you with financial assistance and vice versa. Our teams of uh, independent adjudicators have been working tirelessly to ensure that as many people as possible receive a relief during this time. If we take the sport uh, uh, sector and its adjudication process, uh, the adjudication panel uh, in this uh, section of our work was the first to be appointed on the 9th of April, the first to begin adjudicating, as well as the first to complete the process. As things, stands, uh, as things stand today, the total number of sport applications received is 470. The number of approved and paid sport, sport applicants is 296 and 174 declined. A total of 26 appeals have been received and the appeals committee has said uh, this week to review those 26 appeals. 10 were successful and three were rejected. There are two successful uh, applicants who appealed, uh, but they were rejected. Uh, here I can say these are chance takers. Uh, these people applied, uh, they were successful, they received their relief fund, and then again they appealed, uh, just trying to uh, take chances and they were detected. The remaining 11 appellants still have information outstanding. On arts and culture, the adjudication process was not without its glitches. However, we have been rectifying these as we move on and have made uh, significant progress. The original number of uh, successful applicants was 1,250, but the high number of those rejected compelled us to set up an appeals process to give a platform to those who were not recommended for their case uh, to be heard by the Independent Appeals Committee. We, we did make a point here last time that uh, uh, we were concerned uh, by the high number of uh, people who application was uh, declined by the adjudication uh, committees uh, and uh, of particular uh, importance to us is that most of those people who were declined uh, happened to be coming from historically disadvantaged communities and you could see that they desperately need this assistance. So we decided that we need to look into the ways of ensuring that at the end of the day, those who desperately need uh, assistance uh, do get it within the confines of the legal precept. As a result, the number of success successful applicants has increased to 1,520, therefore reducing the number of those not recommended from 1,930 to 1,660. And the number will continue to change because of the 1,284 appeals emails that have been received to date. The panel has attended 
to 698. 270 of those uh, have been successful. 1,050 had been sent for payment by the 26th of May. However, that number has since increased uh, by 270 as of the 29th of May, which came from successful appeals, thus bringing the number, the number ready for payment to 1,320, of which 592 have already been paid. The balance is being attended to every day. On Wednesday, the 6th of, of May, uh, we held a successful meeting with the sector, especially key national organizations in the sector, to look at how, within the legal parameters, uh, we can ensure that those who really need assistance, especially from the disadvantaged communities, receive funding. And this meeting was, was helpful also because uh, <clears throat> the industry uh, volunteered uh, their assistance uh, to the department, especially the process of adjudication, uh, to fast track it. And we have seen that uh, there, there's been a move, particularly from, from, that, uh, from that aspect. The Federation of uh, the cultural uh, sector was there, the Cultural and Creative Industries Federation of South Africa, SIFSA, the South African Music Industry Council, uh, SAMIC, the South African Screen Federation, SASFET, the South African Arts and Culture Youth Forum, uh, SACAIF, the Independent Black Film Makers Collective, IBFC, the South African Roadies Association, SARA, South African Music Support Association, uh, Children and Broadcasting Service, uh, South Africa, uh, all of them were there in the, in the meeting. And they uh, were grateful uh, for their uh, cooperation uh, during this time and assistance, including uh, their uh, availing themselves uh, to assist the process. And we have subsequently beefed up our mechanisms uh, in order to fast track the process, as we said, uh, with the assistance from uh, the sector. Since the announcement of the lockdown, there's been no sectoral activity to date. The announcement of amended regulations under level three is indeed going to see the gradual introduction of various sectoral activities however, under strict adherence to safety measures, as outlined under the disaster management regulations. Let me take this opportunity and applaud our sector for the discipline demonstrated since the commencement of the lockdown period. This is not easy because uh, there is no sector as affected more than our sector. Uh, by the measures uh, of the lockdown, uh, especially because this is the sector which uh, derives its livelihood by having many people or crowds of people uh, to support it. The 100% adherence to the lockdown regulations by the sector by ensuring that no sectoral activity takes place during this time has indeed played a tremendous role in assisting with the reduction of the spread of COVID-19. We as the department uh, are committed to rebuilding a better society towards an advancement of the sector uh, beyond uh, COVID-19. We are aware on the of, of the daily challenges uh, our uh, athletes and, and artists uh, basically because of the measures uh, of the lockdown, uh, they, they are hungry. And they say it uh, all the time, that we can't work as 
Silambile minister. So the government will continue within its power to do everything possible to ensure that we really uh, soften this blow of COVID-19 uh, to both athletes and uh, artists. DG, I'm going to be uh, dealing with the, the, the directions now. As you know that the, the Minister of Cocta this week uh, announced the, the uh, starting of the opening of sport, especially non-contact sport. Uh, so we'll, we'll deal with that uh, uh, draft uh, uh, directions uh, from, from, from our side. <coughs> the Honorable Minister of uh, COCTA, uh, Dr. Kosazanat uh, Lamini Zuma, designated under Section 3 of the Disaster Management Act of 2002, Act Number 57 of 2002, having declared a national state of disaster, published in Government Gazette, published in Government Gazette, number 43364, on the 28th of May 2020, hereby in terms of Section 27, uh, two of the Disaster Management Act of 2002, after consultation with the relevant cabinet members, published the regulations. In the said published regulation, I'm empowered by Regulation uh, 371, subsection E, read with uh, 39.2, subsection B, to issue direction after consultation with Minister Dr. Kosazana Lamine Zuma, Minister Ronald Lamula, Minister Zuelim Kize. The purpose of, the, of these directions is to, one, prescribe temporary measures or steps currently necessary to manage COVID-19 in order to reduce the, its impact in the Republic by preventing the importation of and minimizing the local transmission of COVID-19, and two, allow professional non-contact sport to host sports events without spectators and professional athletes to train irrespective to whether it is contact or non-contact sport in a staggered way. So what this means is that uh, the process of training would actually uh, resume uh, in, in, in sport uh, <clears throat> generally, both for contact and non-contact sport. The direction seeks to provide for measures in combating the spread of COVID-19 virus by opening up certain non-contact non sport matches to take place during the alert level three regulations and training of sports uh, athletes irrespective of the type of sport codes as follows. All sporting, arts, cultural and religious events organized or held in a stadium or venue as defined in Section 1 of the Safety at Sport and Recreational Events Act of 2010, Act Number 2 of 2010, are prohibited except religious gatherings at, at a faith-based institution whereby not more than 50 people are in attendance and professional non-contact sporting events for the purpose of preparation major multi-coded sport events international championships, national championships, local leagues at club, provincial, national level, excluding combat sport until the minister directs otherwise or the national state of disaster terminates, whichever occurs first. On, res on resumption of uh, non-contact sport and training, sport grounds, fields and swimming pools 
for non-contact sport and training for, prof for professional athletes may resume in compliance with the health protocol without any spectators. All sport bodies must, within 14 days after the publication of these directions, inform the minister in writing as to the date of resumption and further provide an operational guideline, including a guarantee in the form of affidavits related to the testing of all officials before resumption for training and matches. So it's not automatic. Uh, you think you are ready, you, within 14 days uh, of the uh, published uh, directions, you then write to the minister and you, you explain your, your story in a clear way. All sports bodies and professional clubs must develop and implement policies and procedures for their workforce contact, for their workforce contact tracing following employee COVID-19 test. All sport bodies and professional clubs must ensure that athletes and their support staff be subjected to quarantine for 14 days pending the test results. Only determined non-contact professional sport may resume matches after compliance with all provisions of this direction as per annexure one. Here we are for now talking about professional sport because here uh, we have a chance and capacity to monitor. Uh, it's not open for everybody at this stage. As we said that uh, we, are staggered, we are following a staggered approach uh, in, in opening uh, of the matches. Transportation of all athletes, players, support staff must comply with transport directions issued by the Minister of Transport. On the testing and screening of players and support and, and support staff, one, any professional athletes and support staff who test positive may not be allowed to train or participate in any training or matches. Two, all officials, including players, athletes, match officials, support staff, journalists, and television crew, including radio comment commentators, must be subjected to temperature sc screening before they enter the venue or stadium. Three, any person with suspected high temperature may not be allowed to enter the venue or stadium. Four, resumption of non-contact sport training and matches in areas declared as hot spots by the Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs upon recommendation by a cabinet member responsible for health and in consultation with cabinet is prohibited. On sanitation of the training field, the stadium, sports grounds, fields, dressing rooms, and other facilities within the precinct of the stadium must be sanitized before any resumption of training and matches. Two, the chosen facility must be subjected to a thorough cleaning and disinfecting process prior to the arrival of any support staff and players, following the advice issued by the health authorities and the relevant professionals. Three, the venue owner must ensure that specific areas and equipment that come into frequent direct contact with individuals, including but not limited to doorknobs, door bars, door keypads, chairs, armrests, tabletops, light switches, handrails, toilet flush, toilet flush mechanisms, water taps, elevator buttons, 
medical treatment beds and surfaces, gym equipment, all equipment, machines, balls, keyboards, mice, touchscreen monitors, tablets, and trackpads are thoroughly cleaned even more frequently. Where reasonably uh, practical after each conduct. We now move on the control measures. All appropriate information uh, must be displayed in prominent places within the facility. Two, there should be limit in the number of personnel in the stadium, change room, training area in any given time as far as reasonably practicable. Masks, as required by the health protocols, must be worn by all personnel entering the facilities, provided that the professional athletes shall not be required to wear masks when training or participating in matches. Only individual prepared meals with disposable drinking bottles are allowed in the facility. No person is allowed to share water bottle with any other person. The facilities, stadiums, sport grounds, field and venue must provide proper laundry facility. All doors must remain open where feasible to reduce, to reduce contact and ensure adequate ventilation. A dedicated isolation area for use by any individual who exhibits symptoms of COVID-19 whilst at work or in training must be identified. Physical distancing during training must be encouraged and be observed. The following activities are prohibited. Massages, physiotherapy, except for injured players, ice baths and, and, and saunas. The monitoring and compliance. Sports bodies or club must ensure that athletes, players and support staff before returning to training or playing should one, give written confirmation to the COVID-19 compliance officer or nominated operational personnel that they are to the best of their knowledge currently free from COVID-19. They have not had any symptoms of COVID-19 such as high temperature or fever, a new continuous uh, cough or new unexplained shortness of breath in the 14 days immediately prior to the resumption of training or playing. They have not been in contact with a COVID-19 confirmed or suspected case in 14 days immediately prior to the resumption of training or playing. Or club or team medical personnel have taken all infection prevention measures with the addition of the appropriate uh, personnel protective equipment when reviewing patients with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 in the 14 days immediately prior to the resumption of training or playing. Where available, provide written evidence of any relevant COVID-19 testing or immunization that has been validated and recommended by a recognized health practitioner or health facility to compliance officer, that they commit to abide by all the stipulated precautions. Also, ensure compliance with minimum standards, including the following. pre match medical compliance, stadium compliance, team compliance, field base compliance, officials compliance, and league compliance. The, de the department may deploy official to monitor the compliance with the directions as and when the need arises. On the appointment of compliance officer, sport bodies 
or clubs must appoint compliant officers in writing before any resumption of training and matches to mitigate on the compliance with the regulation and the spread of COVID-19. These directions shall be public entities under the Department of Sport, Arts and Culture, including sports federations, sport uh, clubs, uh, the confederation, professional leagues, sport bodies, and events related, uh, relating thereto. These draft uh, directions will be presented to and considered by the legal and regulatory measures work stream of the net joints and subsequently forwarded to the office of the chief state law advisor of the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development for legal opinion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Minister. I think we'll start with Ishmael on the lines for questions. Ishmael, are there any questions? Thank you, DG. We don't have questions at the moment. Thank you. Eba, uh, what's yes. up? Yes, DG, we have one so far. OK. Uh, it's from Chris Van Furen from International News Network. And he's asking, uh, Minister, you entertained all organizations, but what about f f freelance crews in the AV and entertainment industry who are not affiliated to those organizations but constitute the majority of the trade, all, has, all of them who have been without income for the period and will be until we reach level one? Okay. Ishmael, still nothing? Then we can give to Thanks, Minister. DG. We have a caller on the line. Okay. Uh, it's Tony from ENCA. Okay. Over to you, Tony. Um, Minister, just a few points to clarify. Um, firstly, can we not have a breakdown of the specific codes that um, are able to review non-contact uh, matches? Uh, yeah, and then secondly, just clarity as well. So are we saying that non-contact matches can begin, but non-contact training can also begin, or contact training rather can begin, but not with matches. So just clarity on that non-contact and contact training versus matches, please. That's it. Thank you, Minister. Those are the three questions. You. You can respond also from there, but you can also come here. Yeah. But I think it's better when you stand. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good morning, um, Director. Um, General and the, the Minister of uh, Sport, Arts and Culture. Um, there are directives uh, relating to freelancers, uh, relating to arts and culture, and um, I'm sure we will also outline them. Uh, it does cover them. It covers areas of audiovisual, uh, film, and what happens at the playhouses, um, uh, in terms of live streaming, um, Maybe a given opportunity, Minister might just also touch on those uh, also. So they, they are definitely um, covered in that uh, area regarding level three. Uh, on the issue of the some of the non-contact uh, codes that we're sporting codes we're talking about here, it would be um, similar to tennis, um, athletics, uh, chess, cricket, um, we have looked at all those um, that are affected and there is a schedule that uh, outlines uh, these non-contact sports. And indeed it does talk to both uh, training as well as uh, matches, um, but without spectators and at a limited scale, even the level of participation. Yeah. 
one too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks. Um, thank you um, the, for for the questions. Uh, if if I may add uh, from the the very sorry. If I may add uh, from uh, the very first question, uh, the DG, uh, I thought, is going to uh, read the, the directions uh, related to what he referred to uh, on the creatives. Uh, so these uh, directions uh, from the uh, arts and culture point of view were uh, issued in terms of regulation for Subsection 10 of the regulations made under Section 27.2 of the Disaster Management A Act of 2002, Act Number 57 of 2002, live streaming of the creative sector uh, services in support of COVID-19. And here we state that uh, in terms of the regulation 37.1, Subsection E, read with 39.2, subsection B of the regulations issued in terms of section 27.2 of the National Disaster Management Act of 2002, and published in Government Gazette of number 43364, Government uh, Notice uh, number uh, R608 of 28 May 2020, hereby issued the uh, directions in the, in the schedule. Again here, uh, we start with the purpose of the directions, the amendment of the direction, two of the direction, by the addition uh, after the paragraph, the following, we provide directions to the arts and culture sector for production using local cast or performers and crew to be applicable uh, for alert level three. The mitigating uh, measures, amendment uh, of the direction three of uh, the direction uh, by addition numbers on mitigate, mitigating measures. The following mitigating measures for alert level three according to subsector are necessary to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Um, the Performing arts institutions or playhouses that have relevant infrastructure or facilities used for the creation and production of local content. The mitigating measures here is that these facilities can produce content for streaming and live streaming without audiences, monologues, minimal cost, and technical support required. Production take place in compliance with Regulation 28.2 of the regulations, which requires that a compliance officer uh, to ensure that safety controls are strictly adhered to and, and designated. It also co covers uh, film and television production using local cast, uh, living legends and crew. This will include jobs throughout the value chain of production uh, post-production such as technical crew of sound engineers, special effects and animators. So we can go on, on, on and on, but you'll see that uh, in all these sections, whether it's visual arts, craft and design, uh, whether it's music recordings uh, for local broadcast and so on, they have uh, uh, at the heart uh, of it um, freelancers, uh, and, and by the way, freelancers, as, as we indicated last time, um, have applied, some of them, have applied for uh, the relief fund, and, and some of them are part of the people who are continuously um, uh, benefiting out of the fund. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. We'll take last round. Uh, if there's any on the line, Ishmael. Thanks, DG. On the line, we have Max Stradom from Times Live. Over to you, Max. Yeah, hello. 
Hi, uh, Minister and DG, uh, thank you very much. Um, Mark Stradham from Times Live. Um, the question, I'm just going to refer back to the previous question. It wasn't quite answered. Um, we're just seeking clarification. Obviously, we understand non-contact sports can come back in matches. But just particular to contact sports, particularly cricket, uh, rugby and football, can... From what I'm understanding of the regulations, training is allowed if it's non-contact. Can those sports come back to training even though they are prohibited in matches if that training is simply fitness training and, and uh, complies with the regulations? Can contact sports come back to training even though their matches are still not allowed? That is just a specific to, to contact sports. Thank you. Thank you. Is that the only one, uh, Ishmael? Yes, DG, that's all. Thanks. Thank you. Never. Um, thank you, DG. Um, Lloyd Bernard from Sports24 is asking, the football and rugby industries, like many have, like many during this difficult time, have been crippled at a professional level over the last two months. Am I correct in assuming that under the new regulations, professional rugby and soccer teams can go back to training, but their respective leagues cannot go ahead? Can you please elaborate on the discussions with SA Rugby and SAFA and how their roadmap, roadmap back to play looks like? Uh, Craig Ray from uh, Sports Editor at the, the Daily Maverick is asking, Minister asked football to guide him on a briefing in a briefing several weeks ago. Can you please clarify on what uh, can you please clarify what return to play protocols football and rugby in particular have submitted? Um, how much guidance has government taken from FIFA and World Rugby on return to play protocols, which has seen the resumption of some leagues and tournament tournaments. And lastly, uh, Jolene van Weyck from Media24 is asking, will surfing be allowed under level three? Thank you, DG. Thank you. I think those are the last questions and I'm handing over to the minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, the last question uh, that DG will, will take uh, and the roadmap we, uh, from the Sporting codes, which uh, we have been engaging in uh, over a period of time. Um, the last uh, such uh, consultation was uh, yesterday. Uh, but uh, to Mark, uh, yes, Mark, you are, you are correct. Um, uh, all sporting codes uh, would be expected back on training. You would, you would realize that. Uh, uh, our athletes have not been in training uh, and we do not want to have them out of shape uh, forever. Uh, so the process of training would uh, ensue uh, for both conduct and non-conduct sport. Uh, and we are correct to say that uh, from the point of view of non-conduct sport, it's both training and resumption and, uh, of, of uh, playing. But from a uh, contact sport, it's only at the training level. Uh, the DG did mention uh, the, the sporting codes. On uh, football, uh, to um, uh, give us uh, their views and so on, uh, we, are, we are doing that. We are meeting them continuously. Uh, as you know, that uh, there are processes uh, within uh, uh, football itself uh, uh, between the the mother body uh, of football in the country, which is SAFA and uh, the professional league, uh, the PSL. Uh, so we we are in consultation uh, and uh, will continue to to do that. Uh, but as you know, that the uh, football is uh, one uh, conduct sport. Uh, is not open for resumption, uh, as we mentioned now here at the uh, Alert Level 3, that uh, it's only going to be non-contact spot, which uh, is going to resume uh, play. So, uh, yeah, that's it. And uh, the, the last two uh, questions, DG is going to take them.
No, thank you very much, uh, uh, Minister. Yes, um, the, to answer the question directly, on the issue of, um, as, as, as Floyd was asking about the roadmap, we have um, a very good working relationship with the sports bodies. Yesterday in the morning, we had a lengthy discussion with the CEOs, as well as the president of SAFA, as well as the doctor um, um, of uh, uh, SAFA and Pearson. And they were very elaborate on their plans, uh, which it does incorporate also FIFA uh, guidelines on how to deal with this issue of football. But in terms of both rugby, the doctor um, 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 uh, from the sporting fraternity, after a lot of consultations with epidemiologists and various um, a key uh, personnel from the scientific perspective of what it means to return to play, um, they clearly outlined some of the core issues that they have addressed relating to the return to play. And I think among uh, some of the things that they were mentioning was, of course, that they all understand that there is no way in which players can just come back and they are not yet ready for that. So they uh, will comply with their testing requirements. In fact, the here they have moved with very stringent measures that they indicated that it's not just one time testing, two time testing, uh, the issues of no one leaving uh, uh, the PSD, as well as every club should be having a doctor. So they, they have really a comprehensive plan, but they, he indicated because it's uh, the sport, for a sporting codes working collectively, they will then be able to present to the department these uh, protocols. But the various codes have been uh, also submitting individually from tennis, cricket, um, golf. Everyone has been submitting to us, and that is what assisted us a lot in crafting the directions uh, that uh, Minister has read uh, this morning. We should, therefore, we are confident that uh, the FIFA on the side of football um, while South Africa is in a unique uh, situation where we're dealing with a, a situation of um, spike uh, because it's winter period, as a Minister of Health had indicated, and I think um, um, constantly that uh, we are dealing with a very uh, strange situation here because, remember, Europe is getting out of winter and yet South Africa is in entering the winter period uh, where this uh, virus uh, is, is likely to have a negative higher impact. So all these uh, in terms of uh, from the football perspective was also made clear to, to us in our engagement that uh, based on that, their protocols also have considered the risk uh, that is associated with the, the easing and the return to play while it coincides with a period of likely a spike uh, during winter. So uh, I am confident that uh, the, all the sporting codes and the federations have done the best they can to adhere to FIFA protocols. And uh, we, we, we are going to continue to work with them in, in this regard. The, the last question, um, if I'm correct, um, this issue, uh, surfing and water and the virus, has been uh, one of the very um, complex discussions uh, based on scientific uh, versions. Uh, there is a version of this uh, virus thriving in cold environments and therefore then being a risk that uh, people, if they are a group or swimming um, uh, together, um, uh, if it is a swimming um, games, uh, there is a risk but there are those who say there is chlorine, which uh, attacks and destroys the virus. Uh, on the other hand, the issue of surfing, because it's an open water, um, uh, those issues uh, are the matters that we need to, to then discuss for surfing. At least happens uh, where it's individuals um, who are uh, involved there, and uh, it's an open uh, water environment uh, like uh, on the sea. So we, we will engage with the surfer, uh, surfers, um, associations to deal with the matter, but indeed, um, as long as it's part of the non-contact sport, they are covered 
uh, as per the directions uh, that have been indicated and read out by the minister. Uh, I hope I have uh, answered the, the questions, uh, DG, as, as, as raised by Lloyd. Uh, thanks very much. We have come to the end of our briefing and would like to thank everybody. Oh, there's no number. I thought it was the last ones. Minister, if you want to take some more, no number seems to be having pending question from WhatsApp. Yes, DG, it's only three, and I think that there might also be a caller on the line. Oh, we thought we said it's the last, but it's fine. <laughs> Sorry, DG. <laughs> Apologies, DG. They came in as the minister was minister answering, answering the last the last round. Okay. Can I proceed? Yes, you Thank can. Thank you very much. Um, Craig uh, from Daily Maverick is asking again, uh, just clarity on the issue of golf courses. Are golf courses now open or not? Uh, because they will not open for one or three pros, or do they have to apply to open? Um, at the moment, its state's facilities are only open for professionals to train, but a golf course cannot open for one person if there is only one pro. The next question is also related. It's from Vickers Berger from Netwerk Firendundag. When will non-contact amateur sports be allowed to resume? This includes golf, surfing and tennis, if not under level three, under which level? And the last question from Evelyn Morris from Caxton uh, Media in Durban: Recreational sports or recreational or sports fishing, which can also be used to feed people. What are the regulations about that? Thank you, DG. Okay, let's then take the last caller. Thanks, DG. On the line we have Tony. It's a follow-up. Uh, she's from ENCA. Um. I have a number of follow-ups, actually. Um, the first one is, can the Minister of the DG please explain to us what the definition of professional is? We're being asked this by federations themselves. So will a sport that has a semi-professional league be able to continue? Or is it only, for example, men's cricket, football and rugby that can continue? Um, and then also, what is the latest on OPEX, Operation Excellence Contracts for Players? We've been told that uh, players haven't signed their contracts yet, um, and it's been months actually since uh, they've, they've not had contracts. Um, also, when um, in these regulations, is there anything provided specifically on when para sport can return? Because uh, there isn't anything specific about that. And also, can the media possibly be provided with a full list just for reporting purposes so we know which um, federations or sporting codes are returning? Um, and then, is it possible for um, sporting codes in hotspots to travel to a non-hotspot area if they want to continue their sport? Thank you very much. I think, uh, Minister, I'm sorry you're okay. having a whole no, pile. Okay. Did you? And then I'll come. Maybe I must start by uh, the issue of uh, definition of the professional. Um, if you read our regulations, um, the directions um, as provided, um, there is a very thorough professional uh, definition of professional or elite um, sport so that we are all on the same understanding of this. I just want to read uh, the directions so that we are all clear about this professional. But these are people who earn a, um, a living or get paid for the for their um, for for their um, participation in sport, um, and that's why we also included the issue of the as it's a single operational excellence. These are the elite players uh, who are part of that, but going to pay taking a, a part in uh, international or Olympic uh, events of that caliber. 
so they are, are covered and we are clear about what this professional really mean. Um, there is no ambiguity. Yes. And the idea was to avoid um, what Minister regarded as assumed mass participation uh, and amateur uh, participation or participation for recreational purposes. And th that is why the definition and the ability to just clarify what do we mean by professional sport and professionals um, is being covered at this stage. So we do not have um, a situation where uh, anybody at this stage is going to just be waking up and saying, I'm going to play at level three. The recreational sport also is not included. But if people want for recreational purposes uh, to, to keep fit and healthy as amateurs, remember that um, the general directions does provide for people to, 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 for purposes of fitness to wake up and uh, even the restrictions there have been limited in terms of the times that people can be involved in fitness um, uh, or training or exercises that they can do as long as they are not in groups or whatever. So professional sport only refers to the sports where the athletes are earning an income through sport. And uh, that is why we are clear around that issue. There is a, a question that has been raised uh, by Shoni, um, or that it was the issue of professional and excellence. We are re combining both professional as well as elite uh, as part of those sporting athletes that must be allowed to participate. Now, the question by Craig, uh, in relation to the golf, uh, as we have indicated, the issue is here at this stage we are talking about professional. And therefore, when we talk about non-contact sport and recreational and having the golf field now open for one person or whatever, um, we will provide further directions on this matter in clarifying about golf because golf has been one of the core sports that is now allowed and uh, uh, to take place uh, in terms of level three as part of the non-contact sport um, and the issue of then the numbers uh, on how many people remember sport the golf course for instance first thing it, you just need to maintain the golf course and 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 uh, if they do not have that they will have a problem two we were looking at the number of players who can be there because they can play at various areas and they've got KDs who are involved in this and all those. Um, but because it's non-contact sport, uh, the directions are clear that they are covered. So, Craig, we, we might have to provide more detail uh, on what you are asking um, in terms of the numbers. But definitely in level three, we are having golf as part of the non-contact sport. Uh, and was one of the key uh, people who had asked for this opening and opportunity as non party as non contact sport recreational as i've indicated at this stage uh, no we have not opened for that directions are very clear the reason why professional sport the process of easing scientifically is proven that the body needs to adjust. Otherwise, we're going to have professional players who are going to be just waking up. It's level one. Now they need to go and play. But they have not been training. Their body has not been accustomed to and conditioned to perform at that level. And therefore, then you end up with serious injuries, which will be counterproductive. And remember also that we are dealing with the issue here when we say opening up or easing at level three, we also have to link this to the economic recovery and professional sport does generate revenue and everything. So that is why we're starting there so that we are able to assist the professional bodies to start getting ready and geared towards the opening of competitive games. Um, I'm not sure, Minister, if I've left anything uh, else. Um, the travel to non-hot sports, I think that is very clear in the regulations, the major regulations. Our directions are guided by major regulations. 
the main regulations. And there is very clear the issue of interface between the hot spot and the non hot spots is very clear that it should not happen. Uh, that is my understanding in terms of regulations. And therefore, then you cannot say now with these directions, you overrule the regulations just because now it's about sport. If it is from hot spot, the issue is that we cannot afford to have carriers of the of the of the virus now transporting it to a non um, hot spot uh, designated area so we are not opening those floodgates we are not changing those rules they stay in force and you cannot use these directions to then contravene that you cannot move from a hot spot to a non hot spot you become a higher risk to those who are who have behaved properly to keep their area as a non hot spot so we cannot be then the in, in a situation where we encourage that when will the conduct spot happen the that one um, at Loni is is quite clear um, level 3 we are dealing with training and preparations and then in all probability depending on the behavior of the virus and the people at this stage, it's, it's envisaged that a contact spot is possible to be at level one. Yeah, uh, just just to say that uh, uh, these are draft uh, directions, um, and and even if they have been gazetted is it's not automatic that you are going to wake up in the morning and go and train you still have to write and make your case uh, before the minister so that's one thing which we need to be very clear about that uh, it's not it's not automatic uh, secondly uh, that uh, on the on the on the creatives uh, that back to the question of the relief uh, we are uh, aware that uh, it's the only area of our work which is remaining now, uh, which we are rounding up, concluding, and uh, we will uh, ensure that we, we, we strengthen the communication lines uh, so that people know where they stand. They don't, uh, uh, they are not left without actually knowing where the process is of them uh, getting relief. But we are happy that a lot of people uh, have come back after receiving uh, their relief and they are happy about that and uh, we are encouraged. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We've come to the end of this briefing uh, and thank you very much for SABC's uh, support. Our next media briefing will be at 2 o'clock and we will be hosting the Department of Transport. Thank you very much. <laughs>